Welcome to season five of How I Made It Through, and thank you for joining us. I have invited Ray Catania, author, metaphysical teacher, and coach to join me as my co-host as we aim to engage, challenge, inspire, and teach you, our listeners, what it really means to be a spiritual being having a human experience. We'll explore not just concepts, but attempt to unravel the neuroscience of metaphysics, as well as practices designed to expand consciousness, increase healing, and develop a profound connection to love. We'll explore God, death, the afterlife, and pushing past limitations as we encourage you to break free of the trance of fear so that you may experience greater freedom, peace, and connection to yourselves, each other, and spirit. Welcome to How I Made It Through. Hey, Today's thanks. guest. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> <Right>? not me. <laughs> Today's guest is going to be Dr. Dean Radin, but super yeah. excited to have him. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we Dean, have Dean no. Radin on the show. Oh my no God. So, so um, yeah, so he goes, he, he teaches at my alma mater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's California amazing. Institute of Integral it's Studies, CIIS in San Francisco. So it is definitely more alternative and about, you know, states of consciousness, the Eastern philosophy, psychology, transcendental meditation, transpersonal psychology. So is your degree in parapsychology? No, it's not. So my degree is what's called um, integral counseling psychology, but it's based on what's called transpersonal, that it's not just yeah. mind body. You understand this, but transpersonal means beyond the human, whatever spiritual Mm -hmm. our metaphysical relationships we have that healing requires yeah. a holistic approach more jungian you know jung jungian oh boy jungian carl, carl, uni, thank you jungian carl jung and yeah. as opposed to sigmund freud oh god yeah sigmund freud now at this point just feels like well, so antiquated i mean he really set yeah, a foundation well, he did you can't like, you know, he still did, you know, amazing work. Right. But for uh, the I time too, Carl had a little, you know, broader perspective on things and definitely got us to another level, but look how long it took for his work to become as popular as it now is. Here he, <laughs> Here is. he, is. Here he is. Nice to meet you. Likewise. Oh man. It's such an honor to meet you. It really is. I, I, I've, uh, you have no idea the influence your work has had on my entire life. Thank you for all you do. That's very kind. Thank you. All right. So again, welcome to How I Made It Through. And we have the pleasure of having Dr. Dean Radin with us. Uh, Dean Radin, PhD, is an American scientist known for his innovative experiments in the study of consciousness and parapsychological phenomena. His work has attracted criticism from skeptics of parapsychology, but has also found support in the scientific community. Dean Radin is currently chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, IONS, I-O-N-S, and associated distinguished professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies. What a pleasure and an honor. I've heard wonderful things from Ray. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. My pleasure to be here. Well, you started your career very much just immersed in materialism. Where and when was the shift to this broadening curiosity that then shaped the tra trajectory of your career and your life? I would say that uh, by the time I finished graduate school, I was pretty deeply a materialist without knowing that that was a thing. Mm. Because you know, when you're in a scientific career, you don't learn about philosophy of science or sociology of science or any of that stuff. So I became interested in other philosophical bases for science as a result of a long-term interest in psychic phenomena, primarily on testing, whether mm -hmm. are these things, the stories that we've all heard, are they really true or not? So I, when I, my first job was at Bell Laboratories and I had a little bit of extra time at work. So I started doing experiments in mind matter interaction. And one of the things that we were interested in was why computers fail. This was quite a long time ago, but the way that the telephone network would work is through switching computers. 
when you pick up the phone and hear a dial tone, it's a computer. Well, how does that happen? It happens through computers that are talking to each other very quickly. So those computers are made so that they're triply redundant. Like they cannot fail. And yet sometimes they do fail. And so the human factors people and engineers get together and figure out why did this thing, what, what made this not work? In our group, we had a guy who I shall not name, uh, who is the, the, the chief software developer for these large, large projects that we were working on. And we knew from experience that if we were giving a demonstration to visiting dignitaries and he was the one who was giving the demonstration, it would not work. And it happened again and again. And so we finally said, this guy's name was Jim. We said, Jim, next time, just don't show up. Just let us do it. And it worked fine. We realized that it was something about his anxiety and being mm -hmm. the, the head of this, this program, a big computer program, to not let him in the room when we did demonstrations. Mm -hmm. So there is a whole realm of mind matter interaction research going on. And maybe it would be relevant for us to at least look at it. I, I visited the lab of Helmut Schmidt, who was one of the pioneers in using uh, true random number generators as a target in mind matter interaction, because it's essentially like a, a very fast form of coin flipping. It becomes an interesting statistical target to, mm -hmm. to measure. So I, I got one of, one of his famous uh, random number generators and I took it back to Bell Labs and started doing experiments on myself and my colleagues to see if, is there actually some kind of an interaction between intention and the behavior of machine, but no other connection. And to my surprise and delight as well, we found that there was that, that how people are thinking about and intending towards a machine that supposedly should not be coupled in any way, you find statistical evidence that it actually does respond. So, so there we have empirical evidence and I didn't really know what to make of it. Like I, I found it difficult to understand what is the connection. And so we did tests that involved the machine at a distance and you still got the similar effects. And so electromagnetism probably wasn't a good answer. And then they got stuck because I, I, well, I don't, what could possibly account for this? And that's when I got interested in saying, well, maybe materialism is a special case. It, it works really well for certain things in the natural world, but it doesn't explain everything. And so let's look at other alternatives. And so that leads you immediately into everything from panpsychism to dual aspect monism to idealism, none of which I had ever heard of before. Well, I think I'd like you to slow those terms down because I'm <laughs> assuming, like myself, our listeners, our viewers are like, whoa, 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 whoa. Can you define those at least briefly? So if you don't think about these things very often, like wh where does your experience come from? What, what gives rise to experience? Most people would say it is the brain. You are your brain. But as it turns out that if you, you think about uh, tasting a lemon, if you look at that from the outside, you're studying somebody who tastes a lemon, they said, oh yeah, this is a lemon. Well, that, that's an experience that they're having. That's an internal sense. It's like physics from the inside yeah. as opposed to physics from the outside. How do we get from a physical substance, a physical machine in your head doing certain things into experience? Nobody knows. So this is the leading edge now and an overlap somewhere between physics and the neurosciences and philosophy to try to figure out, well, where, where does it come from? Where does consciousness come from? Mm -hmm. So one possibility is panpsychism, which is the idea that consciousness is in everything that is material. Like everything all the way down to an atom has some bit of some kind of proto consciousness in it. And so if you bring a whole bunch of material stuff together, it will enjoy a certain kind of consciousness. Because not too long ago, it was thought that, uh, that animals and plants and insects and so on were not conscious right. and no sense of consciousness. That has completely changed over the mm. past 10 years or so. And the question is, does it also go into non-living things? So pan panpsychism would say, yes, it goes all the way down to the atom and below. It's mm -hmm. there, whatever yeah. that is. So how would a rock experience consciousness? We don't know. 
Right. I mean, we have trouble figuring out how a plant would experience consciousness, but nevertheless, that's what panpsychism says. The reason that we have internal experience, subjective first person experience, is because it's always there. It's in every material substance, and we happen to experience it in a certain way because of the recursion and mechanisms of brain activity. So would you say, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Would okay. you say that's the same as uh, consciousness being the unifying factor? Um, does that play into this? Is that kind of the same thing when we say that consciousness is in all things? Yes, it's one way of saying that consciousness is universal. It is the universe is conscious. Right. Because it's material. So this this kind of a halfway point between materialism and something else, panpsychism. Uh, and there's many flavors of panpsychism. So uh, uh, you could think of this then as uh, a step away from that would be something like dual aspect monism. Also a variety of which is known as neutral monism. So this is philosophers like Spinoza and Leibniz, people like that. And they were also thinking about, well, where, where does experience come from? Where does the mental world come from? Uh, Descartes' solution was mind and matter are two completely separate things. That's mm -hmm. dualism. And of course, that raises a problem that if they're really to so different from each other, then how could they possibly interact? Right. That there is there is mind, there is matter. Somehow they're connected in some way by meaning, which is neither physical or non-physical. It's something else. It's our interpretation of things. So, mm. Wow. 10 years, though, is such a short blip of time. I mean, I feel like 10 years was yesterday. So that's a radical leap to assign consciousness to otherwise entities that they said, no, 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 these are just simply matter. Yeah. And that I just, it, to me, that's hopeful that there is progress in terms of the conversation and the questions and the conclusions and the hypotheses being rendered. Yeah, it, it is a radical change. In 10 years. Yeah. And so that, so dual aspect monism is a way of thinking about it as two sides of the same coin. Mm. Right. You have a head and a tails. They look quite different from each other. You look at them really up close and they're really different. But when you step away from it, you realize it's not that different. And the, the mind and matter or the, the, the heads and tails are now intimately correlated with each other. If something happens on one side, something must happen on the other side. So that relationship then is what we see as neural correlates of consciousness. The next step up from that is idealism. And idealism uh, is the philosophy that everything is basically consciousness. All there is, is consciousness. It's all mind or consciousness. The, the tricky part on that is then, well, where does the physical world come from? Yeah. What gives rise to the physical world as we experience it? And depending on the flavor of idealism, you will either say all of that physical stuff is an illusion. Mm -hmm which is actually not a bad argument because our entire experience of everything is all happening inside our head somehow. Mm -hmm. right. So it's like right. we're, we're constructing it. Yes. So the, the typical way to refute that argument is to, to hit the wall with your hand, in which case you would say, well, that, that doesn't seem like an illusion to me. <laughs> I did that as a kid. I remember right. having conversations as a young teen. Yeah. yeah. Why doesn't my hand go through the wall? If the atom is 99.9% .9 space. Yeah. Like that, yeah. Well, so there are, there are physics answers to that having to do with fields uh, and sure. forces yeah. and all that stuff. But nevertheless, a, a hardcore idealist, you would say in this case, would say, no, it actually is an illusion. Mm. That, it, that the illusion is much deeper than simply our own experience. Because now we're talking about consciousness, not human centric, yes. but it permeates everything. It is everything. Right. Everything is consciousness. Mm -hmm. Do you think we can instill our own uh, self-limiting beliefs with the oh, wall, sure. let's say, for example, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if everything is consciousness, then everything, everything is modulated in ways by your intention, your attention, your belief, your, your needs. All, all of that is going to modulate it to some extent. Hmm. And, and we know that things like belief will certainly make a big difference, not just a placebo effect, but you right. can push the placebo really hard and your at least your experience of the world will be heavily influenced 
I do believe. Exactly. And that's so much of what we talk about on this show, either placebo, nocebo, belief, law of attraction, this idea around everything has consciousness and the idea that our expectations, our belief have such a manifest impact on the course of our lives. What is the difference between or how, what is the relationship between consciousness and energy? Because I also hear people say everything is energy, energy with consciousness. Can you help parse that out a little bit? Yeah, energy and terms that are related to it, like frequency, come up a lot. Yeah. So the energy, I think that what people talk about in terms of energy is felt energy. It is the subjective side of what your body feels like when it goes through different kinds of energetic states. That's usually quite different than what a physicist would talk about in terms of energy. So it like put on your philosophy hat for a second. It'd be like saying that's a category mistake. We're using that word, energy, frequency, vibration. I could feel all that stuff. That's not what you would find in a physics course or talking to an engineer. So when it comes down then to what do we think we mean by an energetic state, especially one that has consciousness. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Does anybody know? I, I mean, they even go just step back further from that and go into physics and say, well, ask a physicist, what is energy? And what you'll get as a response is, well, it, it has to do with the ability to do work, the ability to do things. Well, okay. That's, that's like a description of what it does, but what actually is it? Yeah. There is no answer. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. Yes, exactly. We, we don't know. Why does an electron have a charge? What is charge? Why, yeah. why, why? All of these why questions where you start going further and further down, we don't know. Because to me, that's that precipice or that intersection of, um, you know, science and spirit, you know, that that could be when people start talking about the one force, the one source, like where's the origin of this? Do in your work, do you ever have conversations or inquiries into that? Oftentimes. And and then, but then I immediately have to ask them, well, what do you mean by spirit? What is, <laughs> what does spiritual mean? Yeah, well, there's yeah. a thousand different meanings to that. And if it's something that is outside the realm of, the, of something that we can test, well, then it becomes very difficult to know how do we proceed? All we have are stories. Right. So coming from a, an engineering and an experimental psychology background, I, I tend to not dive into the stories as much, but I use the stories as uh, motivation for studying something. You know, I hear lots of stories. My first inclination is to say, well, I wonder if that's true. If it was true, then we should be able to do these things in a laboratory or some way and figure out to some degree of confidence that it's actually true. Yeah. Because if I can't do that, then I could still be very interested in it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to do with it. Impasse. Yeah. You've hit an impasse. Um, from doing a little research on you, I know that early on you started to uh, learn about and practice transcendental meditation and those different states of consciousness really opened a door. So tell me about your experience of being a human being in this line of inquiry and meditation. So I started uh, uh, learning how to do TM in 1970. It, was, it wasn't too long after it actually showed up in the United States. So as among the, the first crop, uh, that led to many, many other kinds of meditative experiences. And after many years of kind of settled on Vipassana as, as my favorite method, even though all of them basically, I think, end up in the same space eventually. Uh, with TM, after I started meditating within about a month, I, I started to have pretty significant visual distortions that, that were kind of frightening mm. because I didn't, no one was explaining, first of all, that it would happen or what it meant or anything. Yeah. So I stopped after a couple of months because uh, the distortions, like walking down a hallway that you'd see the entire hallway starting to turn. So like uh, as though space and time were deciding to do something that I didn't think they should be doing. Right. And well, that wasn't very good. Yeah. Uh, so when I, I stopped and the, the, it all faded away eventually. Okay. On the other hand, 
what happened also was a, a moment that I would call a, a, a moment of waking up mm. that was like a step function. And that before that happened, I was a certain person. And after that happened, I was a different person, like a step function, like boom, in an instant, which I remember very clearly because it was so out of ordinary for me. It felt very much like, oh, I've just woken up from a dream. And then all that other stuff is still there, but it fades very quickly. It's like, it's not as clear as it is now. Well, that has happened maybe three times that I could remember something like that some sort of a step function, which in hindsight, I could look at and say, yes, it was related in some way to meditation. Just simply getting into a slightly deeper state of awareness that I'm usually at, it triggers something. So I, I have great sympathy then for people who, who have a, a true awakening experience where the, uh, one of these transformative kinds of events that happen. Uh, what I experienced was not a mystical state, at all. Like I didn't feel any kind of unity with anything. I just felt that, oh, I was sleeping before, but now I'm not. So yeah, that was the, the, med the transcendental meditation experience. I'm pretty sure it was related to that. Uh, and then I dropped it for years because I didn't know what to do with it. You're at this really interesting intersection as all people are in studying parapsychology from the, the lens of being a scientist and also recognizing these different states of consciousness. And you just said that there are just times where the questions just keep going and going and going. Like, where does energy come from? We just don't know. What is the source? What are some of the inquiries that have been most compelling to you that the stories or the even the ruminations or the fascinations just have really shaped your life? Great question. Yeah, that is a good question. I would say that the, the underlying push has always been curiosity because I'm curious about lots of things. Yeah. Uh, parapsychology is among the most curious that I've encountered because it forces a reconsideration of things that we've been taught. Parapsychology is, is a, a use of science. It's taking the tools and techniques of scientific methods and applying it to these kinds of experiences. Because then you have a, a possibility of gaining confidence that the effects that people talk about are true mm -hmm. or not true, because it could be delusional as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, in, in the process of doing that over many decades now, I've come to the eventually kind of a realization that we really are capable of way more than, than we're generally told. And, and we don't need religion to sit on in order to understand it. We don't, after some while, you don't even need the esoteric traditions. Mm -hmm. It simply is what it is. Yeah. Well, what do you make then of psychics and psychic mediums who claim to say there is communication and we are being told, my guides are telling me we're not ready. They are here in a protect. I mean, I hear all sorts of lore so to speak, or people having first person testimonials of communication, you know, someone who, again, in this vast universe, we cannot be the only ones that just doesn't even make sense. How do you hold that? That becomes an experience. And then, then the question is, well, how do we test that experience? Yeah. Because we, we hear channelers and mediums and so on. So some of it is not testable at this point. If somebody is talking about communicating with uh, creatures from Zeta Reticuli and they have messages for it, I'll listen to it. Um, much of the time, the messages are platitudes, which are fine. But if they were true, how do we test if that's true? How do we test if any of it is true? And the answer is that right now we don't know how to. Mm -hmm. So it goes into a very large bin of experiences that people have. Are there things that we can prove that you have proven or that you do believe in? Yeah. So we have this large bin of experiences and then our challenge is how do we take things out of that that we can test? Because most of it we actually can't. Yeah. So one thing that we can test with mediums is, is the medium getting accurate information because we have ways of verifying if, the, if, if it's in fact accurate. Well, it doesn't say then that the medium is communicating with an entity, non-physical entity. 
all of that all that the experiment can tell us is that they're getting accurate information from somewhere in a sense that's sort of what any clairvoyance experiment is telling us if we don't have a way to verify that the internal impression actually matches something out there in the real world then it becomes a story what you can do is a medium or a really good psychic can get information that you verify and say, okay, it looks like they're hot. Well, now give me information about something else that we can't verify right now, like what happened on Mars a million years ago. And since they were hot on this task that we can verify, we can have a little bit extra confidence that this other target they're looking at, well, maybe that's true too. And maybe someday we'll figure it out. So that that's about the best that we can go. Uh, so in, in terms of verifying clairvoyance, verifying that mediums can get the information that's accurate. We can do that. For most of what's considered to be channeling, we can't. Mm. Unless the information, or, and by the way, the same is true for past lives. In most cases, you have no way of knowing. Exactly where I was going. So a lot of a lot of the, what we can think of as contemporary interest in psychic fill in the blank. Yeah. From an experiential point of view, it's great. I mean, we have huge imaginations, which are wonderful. Uh, it's the verification part, which oftentimes is very difficult to get. And in a sense, that's what I'm interested in. It's where, because once you have confidence that is true, that it is possible to do these things, the very next question that always comes up, how do you explain that? Yeah, of course. When we're asking for an explanation, what we usually mean is a causal sequence of events that matches what we understand them from a materialistic perspective. Yes. But there are other ways of giving explanations, much, much bigger, much broader ways of looking at it, which requires a, at least a toe that is put a little bit into philosophy. And when you do that, you, you come out with what I think is probably the case, that materialism is really, really good as a way of studying certain things. It gives rise to the technology that allows us to do this kind of an interview, mm -hmm. but it doesn't give us the entire story. It's mm -hmm. a special case. It's a special case that's sort of human centric and mostly, but not completely classical physics. That's like our everyday worldview. It's really, really good in providing explanations there and slowly beginning to move out into more esoteric worlds, the quantum mechanics is but it doesn't explain everything. Well, then what would explain everything? Well, panpsychism, dual aspect monism, idealism, these other philosophies. And those other philosophies then say, this is a much broader view of, of everything. And materialism is a special case that sits inside it. So I'm curious to know where the places are, where it's just, there's just not any evidence. You can't say, well, here we can provide evidence. Have there been places where there was evidence in your lifetime, your career, where you thought, or others have collectively thought, we'll never know this. And then they know something or collect a bit of evidence. That's the entire history of science. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, in terms of parapsychology, in terms of um, phenomena that has been heretofore never scientifically validated? Um, I would say that the, the elementary psychic phenomena have, have all been shown pretty, pretty well to be true since around the 1880s. Yeah. We're talking about simple things like telepathy and precognition and so on. Where we start failing are the, the, the larger effects, levitation. It would be great to have somebody come into the lab and just sit on a scale and make it like one pound less or even a fraction of a pound, anything. We don't see that. That doesn't mean it's not true. It just means that we can't capture that somehow in the lab. Uh, same thing or similar with, with channeling with most of physical mediumship, right? These are uh, long-term stories that have been around forever. Very, very difficult. To, to capture in a way that would provide any kind of scientific confidence. So I used to imagine, in, if, if for my own experience now, that I heard lots of stories about spoon bending with Yuri Geller in the 70s and then lots and lots of other people, including colleagues who claimed that they were able to do things like bend a steel bar. 
well, if it's a quarter inch or more, you can't do that. The human can't do that. There's not enough, you don't have enough strength to do it. So I didn't know what to make of all of that. It's, it, there, are, there have been studies done in the 70s and 80s uh, by physicists mostly looking at uh, what is happening to metal when it's bending in this mysterious way. But then it was dropped. It, it was dropped largely because magicians got a hold of it and said, no, it's all fake and don't bother it. But of course, that doesn't stop it from being in popular culture. And there's still lots of PK parties that are, that are done to look at this stuff. So I went to one of those parties. It was sort of drag kicking and screaming. Uh, and it was at a conference that was being held. And so part of the fun of the conference would be a workshop to do this kind of thing. So I, th I thought to myself, well, people in this workshop have claimed to have done it before, but the only kind of bend of a piece of metal that I'd be interested in was bending the bowl of a soup spoon in half. And the reason is that you can't do that with your fingers. It's not possible because the shell shape resists any kind of bending. Mm -hmm. So I decided to find somebody who claimed that they had done that and then sit right in front of them and watch very closely to see it happen because that would, that would be great. Yeah. So to, to get a better kinesthetic sense of what was happening, uh, as this woman was in front of me who claimed to do it, she was holding the spoon in a certain way and so I held it the same way. And so we, we go through this process to get everybody all hyped up uh, to uh, and then shout bend at the spoon and all of this part of the, the, the ritual involved in getting into the right state. And somebody behind me said, oh, look, you did it. And I turned around thinking, well, you know, where, who did it? I did it. <laughs> so th this is the, uh, this is the spoon. I don't know mm -hmm. if it'll show up. Oh, yeah, yet. it's absolutely. That's, that's the spoon that I bent. And I, I have since got the same kind of spoon from the same manufacturer. I measured how much torque is necessary okay. to do that. It is way beyond what I can do. And yeah. even at the time when that happened, I looked at it sort of dumbfounded and it wasn't bent all the way yet. So they said, well, bend it all the way. So I just gentle pinch and sure enough, boom, went all the way over, immediately hardened up and has been that way ever since. So, you know, so here's an anomaly staring me in the face, which is on my desk all the time <laughs> to, to remind me of course, yeah. that it sometimes would take a, a personal experience of that type to actually get to the point, to get beyond a place where it was at that point exceeding my boggle threshold. And so I imagine that other people will have experiences and you, know, you can't demonstrate it to somebody else, but you know what happened. Yeah, And then it's important to go through some kind of a self discovery on it to say, well, could I have been delusional? Could I, I mean, could I have been mistaken? Could it be confabulation? Could it be this and that? And the reason why I think it happened is because I got into a kind of motivational state, which was so out of the ordinary for me that I, I, I have not been able to get it back into it. But I felt like like the, the universe would end if I did not do this. Mm. I mean, it's this kind of level of completely crazy obsession mm -hmm. that I must do this. At the next day at this conference, I was giving a talk and I was gonna wear my suit. And if you were able to bend the spoon in this way, the, the guy who was leading the party would give you a big yellow button. And I was imagining myself on the stage with the big yellow button, mm because that would then prove that I had all of these great psychic powers. And I, I'm not a psychic, I mean, I'm a scientist, but somehow this became a, this crazy obsession. I needed the button. Yeah. And that, that need, oh. that, that put me into a state which blasted me out of any skepticism that I may have had and allowed me to do something which up until then I thought was impossible. And I, I've done other things, not quite like that, but in every single case, when you do something like that, at least for me, it's frightening. My first reaction is fright. Later, you think about it more calmly and think, oh, well, that's interesting because you can try to think of why, why could that happen? How could that possibly happen? But see, now that's thinking analytically about it. But the experience at the time was, holy crap, how in the world did I do that? And I did not know, to this day, I don't know, 
Yeah. Which immediately raises the question of what else am I influencing? That would well, be something. I love your relationship to it is it's frightening because I don't have it under control, but I imagine so many people, even as I'm hearing the story is like, that's so exciting. What might be possible? And again, we have raised so many conversations with people about the law of attraction and intention and you just being so absorbed. And it's not just your energy. You've got this, I imagine a room full of a lot of people. Yeah. The possibilities just feel really tantalizing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is not that, uh, it's not the sort of thing that you can talk about in a, a scientific conference. I bet not. Uh, other than, I mean, some you can, like in a parapsychological association meeting, I can do that. But in a conference where you're trying to maintain any sense of credibility at all, you, you, you can't talk about it in these terms. I bet you can. Uh, at least in some places, you know, this is changing too. That the reason why I mentioned that, like our ideas about what is what has consciousness, what is conscious, is the plant conscious, that has changed so dramatically in the, in the past 10 years or so. And you're beginning just now to see that in, in circles within what we can think of as conventional science, there's beginning to be an openness Thank to, God. there's a, a whole bunch of mysteries here, which are very interesting. They have something to do with the relationship between consciousness and the physical world. Mm -hmm. That opens the door a lot. And it, it's not saying suddenly every, all the scientists are believing this stuff because most of them are still very skeptical, but it allows a dialogue and so this is also what we're talking here about a taboo and a stigma mm -hmm. that's going to break too. It's, it'll take a little longer because it will require a radical reformation of what we think we are, uh, yeah. but it'll happen. But it will happen. Thanks in no small part to people like you who have the courage. Leading the way. Yeah. To Thank lead you. the way and open conversations because my perception is in the field you are in, being able to stand by your work in a way that shows acceptance in the credibility of who you are as a scientist, you are risking people going, well, that's strange or whatever judgment they may have to push a very important conversation or inquiry forward that will help advance humanity. Mm -hmm. I guess. <laughs> that's my Without voice. Being that's my at the stake. Yeah, Without being burned as a goddamn mistake. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But if somebody had told me early on that that was one of the consequences, I'm not sure I would have done this. I probably, would have, I probably would have continued to do it as a hobby, but not yeah. be as public about it. Fair enough. But there's also a piece of me which uh, some is somewhere between, I don't care what other people think. Yeah. And also a little bit of delight in pushing pushing the envelope. And I, yeah, I understand the, the social norms and all that. It's just not high on my, my list of things that I am paying attention to, I guess. Yeah. So um, we want to make sure that people can get in touch with you, but with all that you've shared, and again, that line that you're walking between materialism and these experiences that can be unexplainable, some of which you've started to understand philosophically and otherwise, what to you, how would you define, you get to the end of your life, how do you define a life well-lived? Uh, it was uh, something that Joseph Campbell said, it's follow your bliss. Mm -hmm. And so I, I took that to heart and I figured that if I could do whatever I wanted to do, I would be paid to do whatever I wanted to do. And so what has turned out to be the most interesting thing where I don't get bored, which is a problem, I get bored pretty easily, Mm -hmm. uh, is to is to push on the edge of who and what we are. Mm. And, and the easiest way to do that is through studying psychic phenomena. I love that answer. How do people reach you? If they want to learn more, get your books. And you've got, and I've got to put my glasses on here. Um, you've got a bunch of books here. You've got The Conscious Universe, Entangled Minds, Super Normal, and The Real Magic that have already been published. Right. Okay. So deanradin.com, okay. that's my personal website. And I work at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which is noetic.org. And that'll get you most places. Wonderful. This has been Thanks. so interesting. Thank you for your time and your, Good. your expertise. You're welcome. 
How I Made It Through is produced and distributed by EIQ Media, LLC. Elevate your emotional IQ with podcasts and content focused on overcoming adversity, leadership, mental health, entrepreneurship, spiritually transformative experiences, and more. 